good morning. We cut out our video for the service today because we had a little long beginning today. Uh, so you can watch Patch Adams, the fingers scene. You Google it, watch it at home. Three minutes just got back in our service. All right. So um, <clears throat> are you in the middle of a questioning time? Are you in the middle of something where you're saying, why is that happening? How does that make sense? I got a text at 1135 last night that said, uh, I'm rushing my wife to the hospital. Uh, or excuse me, the paramedics just picked up my wife. I'm following her to the hospital. Pray for us. At 1.30 this morning, I got a text that said, she's okay, just had this minor problem. Why does that happen? You ever have those problems in life and you're in that waiting time trying to figure out why is this occurring? Today I'm going to look at what the soul needs and maybe it'll answer some questions or at least give you some keys to, you know, why would God allow suffering? Why would I go through this difficult situation? Why would announcements run so long that the pastor's sermon is shorter? Why would all of those things happen today to me? The good news for you guys is every time somebody gives a longer announcement, the sermon gets shorter and shorter. Most pastors look at their watch in order to tell you they're going overtime and you're out of luck. So when the soul is not centered, no one is ever sure what temptations are worth resisting, what things you shouldn't say, or what sacrifices are worth making. Now, have you ever used this ingredient? How many of you have? This is, this is cornstarch, for those of you who don't know. Okay, how many of you ever used cornstarch? How many of you have no idea what cornstarch is? All right, I'm going to give you something really cool you can do if you didn't know this. If you have some cornstarch at home, this is for people who don't cook. Put a little water on the cornstarch. Put it in your hand, put a little water, and roll it into a ball, and it'll become a ball. And as soon as you stop, the cornstarch will melt off of your hand. And if you move it again, it'll become a ball again. It is the coolest thing to do with kids. You can waste lots of time with children. And if you put it in a big pan, you can tell them they're walking on water. And if they stop, then they'll sink. It's, it's really, really cool. So here's the thing. If you took a spoonful of this, or you took a spoon of cocoa powder, I don't know if you've done that before, yeah, everybody said, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with you people, but right. You realize this is not good by itself. When the Bible says that all things work out for the good. It doesn't mean that everything's good. Some of you right now have an ingredient in your life that's frustrating or irritating or devastating. One of my friends posted two days ago that his son was shot. Last night he posted, today we're going to have to take him off life support. It was Neil's roommate, those of you who know our former music pastor in college. We know him really well and we say, why? And so today I want you to know that there are times when there's not really good answers. There's times that you may not have all the answers, but hopefully... Even though your situation's not good, that you can have peace, hope, and assurance, no matter what happens. So here's the three things the soul needs. The soul needs God's purposes, his presence, and his power. And those are fun to say. You can just say purpose, presence, and power. And if you are Yosemite Sam, don't try it. Number one, trusting God's purposes bring peace. This is when you ask, why God? Why would this happen? Why would this person get cancer? Why would that really nice person die? Why that jerk is still alive? By the way, I've told people all the time, God's giving them a chance to repent, right? But anyway, but, but I don't really know the answer. But here's what I know, that God can work things out. There's a, the CEO of Ritz Carlton. If you've never heard him speak, his name is Horst Schultz. He's unbelievable. I don't even know how old he is. I think he's 90 now, still running around the world giving talks because he's amazing. But he talked about how when he first got a job, he was very young, got a job as a busboy in a hotel. And so 
he was working and maybe working as a bellboy too. And he wanted to be promoted and there was a promotion coming and he knew about it. And he had been there the longest. So he just knew he was going to get promoted. But he didn't. Some other guy got promoted and of course he did what we do. He got mad and got frustrated. But he did something that we don't always do. He went home and looked in the mirror. And he realized he was coming to work late. Just a few minutes late every day. What was the big deal? He was coming to, to work grumpy. He was, when he was asked to do anything extra, he would refuse to do it. And he realized, wait a second, I'm doing the least amount possible. And yet I want to be promoted. And because of that, it helped him to evaluate his life. And he said, you know what? I want to start doing everything with excellence. I was reading a book recently that it said, hey, everything you do, if you're going to go ahead and do it, if you're going to spend your time to do something, do it with passion. Don't do it, oh, I got to do this today. Do it because God's called you to do it. Listen to what it says in Scripture, and you've heard this verse misused. This is the most misused, abusive verse in the Bible for many people. And we know, Romans 8, 28, that in all things, God works for the good time out. When it says God works, that's where we get the word synergy. And if you work at any corporation, bosses love to use that word. They don't even know what it means. They just want you to work with other people and leave them alone. But what synergy means is I can take this cornstarch, I can put it in my biscuits and gravy. Oh yeah. Right. And thicken it up and make it delicious. You would never eat it by itself. That's foolish, but it can make other things better. It doesn't say that all things are good. Notice it says that God can work all things for the good, but there's a couple of caveats. Number one, to those who love him. And then it says who've been called according to his purposes, which means this. If you are making unhealthy choices, you can't go to McDonald's and pray, God, make this food healthy to my body. Okay, let's just just get that out of the way, right? I mean, right? Every church in Alabama today is going to pray over the fried chicken and ask Jesus to make it healthy. That's a prayer God has never answered. Maybe make you healthy would be the thing. And the truth is, if you're emotionally unhealthy, if you are emotionally destructive to other people, if you are are emotionally immature and you're refusing to deal with your issues and you're not letting God convict you, you're just pursuing whatever you feel like, guess what? It won't work out for the good. We all know people, and you say, they had so much potential. And I do their funerals here because they died young from a drug overdose. They, they went out of their way, and what they do? what they do? They went outside of God's purposes, they pursued it. Now, here's the good news. If on this very day you say, God, I want to pursue those, your purposes. I've made a million bad choices until today. And God, I want to do what that verse says. I want to fall in love with you and pursue your purposes. What's awesome about that is God says, okay, I can use all of your story and work it out for the good. And then it continues. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, for what reason? To be conformed to the image of his son. See, everybody gets caught up in the whole predestined thing. That's not what the focus is of this verse. It says the purpose of this is not so you can have the best life now. By the way, I'd love to be a TV preacher and lie to you. You give a money to this church. You send me money, we'll send you a book and your life will be perfect. If you donate $20 today, I promise you when you leave, you will have $20 less. I guarantee you. And I guarantee you that if you're a Christian, there are, the, the goal of God is not to make your life easy and comfortable. The goal is to conform you to be more like Jesus. So even when you're frustrated and irritated and you're dealing with a situation you don't want to deal with and you're under everything, what's the goal? To make you more like Christ. God didn't take all of Christ's pain 
away. His own family came to take him to a sanitarium to tell him he was crazy. They came to get him one time. That's the time he goes, who's my brother and brothers? Which the disciples are like, he also has amnesia, right? I mean, he went through struggle. So it continues to conform to the image of the son. Why? That he might be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And he predestined, he also called us, which means he's given you a purpose. He's also justified. And those he justified, he's always also glorified. Can I tell you that life is sometimes like whitewater rafting? When you're whitewater rafting, sometimes the guy in the back says, right, paddle hard, or whatever they yell, random things. And so you, you dig, dig, dig. But then sometimes they say, get down. And that's typically if you're going over a big rapid, they want you to drop into the bottom of the boat, put your paddle up so you don't whack somebody in the head. That's really the reason for that. And sit there. Sometimes when you're going through a struggle and a trial and you don't have the answers and you don't know what to do. If you try to control what's going on and the people who you're dealing with, if you try to control them, you're just going to hurt people around you. Sometimes you need to get down on your knees and say to God, God, I can't handle this. I don't know the purpose of this. I don't know the why question but I know you'll use it. So the next time that you have a why question, it's okay to have a why question. God's not frustrated by your questions. But you can say, God, I don't know why. But I trust you. By the way, if you're here today and you have an answer to all the why, why questions, see me after church. We're writing a book. I mean, you're going to write it. But I'm going to get credit. Because you know everything if you know all the why. Listen, we all, no matter how mature we are in Christ, we all have times that we go, I don't know. We live in a sinful, painful world, and sometimes things don't go the way we want them to. But God promises that he can even use that garbage, what the doctor just told you, what that friend just told you, what happened with your neck. God said, I can even use that for your good. The whole point of tending to the soul is to fill us so completely with his presence that the brilliance of his love shines through. Wouldn't that be wonderful when somebody says something to you you don't like? Wouldn't it be wonderful when this morning I was taking the sign out to the curb and some guy in a big truck decided to come as close as he could to me at about 20 miles an hour on the way to the stoplight and I didn't throw the sign at him, but it was a thought? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if we acted like Jesus? God bless you, brother. I wasn't thinking, God bless you, I will tell you that. Sensing God's presence brings hope. What then shall we say in response to these things, Paul continues? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously, listen, give us all things? And we love to take that verse and say, well, then God's going to give me whatever I want. Oh, nay, nay. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Is it God who justifies? Who's the one who condemns? Time out. You know who's the one that condemns often? The person in the mirror. Pay attention to what you say to yourself. <laughs> I picked up a, a cord that I had for my computer that I had in a little bag yesterday. And I went to put it in my bag. And when I did, I moved my hand this way and the cord dropped out. And I instantly yelled, Eric! What? I would never do that to somebody else. I, if Don dropped a cord as he was putting it in a bag, I wouldn't go, Don! I would go, dropped a cord, no big deal. But isn't it funny how we're so hard on ourselves for the dumbest thing? I've been up on a ladder, 10 feet in the air, with a screw, gone to put the screw in, and dropped it. And said, Brookins! I sounded like my PE coach in high school, right? Done that? And then it continues. Who will bring any charge? It is God who justifies, who condemns, no one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. And then listen to this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then, it, I don't like the next list. Because I want to tell you that you become a Christian and the Smurfs show up at your house and Willy Wonka brings you the magic ticket, right? 
And everything, you get the parking spot. I never, I heard a pastor one time say, when you have God's favor, you get better parking spots. He went on to say that you also get bumped up to first class on planes. What? And then I read this sentence and I go, you missed it by a little. What will separate us? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or no clothes. Now, why didn't I say that word? Because I'm a hillbilly, and I say it the wrong way, and the only thing you'll talk about the rest of the time is how the pastor said the no-clothes word. Okay, let's continue. Or persecution, or famine, or non-clothes, or danger, or sword. I hope none of you, Don just at work, this could happen, but, but I hope none of you have a sword issue. Have you had any bigger problems than this list? What Paul's saying is no matter what's happening in your life, he's with you. Now in Miami, we had amazing thunderstorms. I mean, almost fun, except when you were a little kid. And I can remember sometimes we would go, my brother and I would sneak into my parents' room. We would lay at the foot of their bed because you never woke dad up because you got hit. And that's absolutely true. And I remember waking up one time after trying to wake him up. But that's another story for another day. And so... So laying at the foot of his bed. And I remember one night was so bad. We went in there and my sisters were already in there. And I remember one time, even my older brother showed up, looked around and walked back out. It was awesome. I'd love to tell you, you lay down with us. But, but when the storm is going on outside and we're laying in our parents, guess what we needed? Their presence. We just, we just wanted to know that we were safe. The storm kept going. And there's times in life that the storm's going to keep going. And there's going to be times in life that you're still dealing with you. (laughs) And there's times in life that you're still dealing with a struggle or a physical ailment or a surgery or a difficulty. By the way, I think I had five different texts in two days this week about either people in our church or their family members that had cancer. In two days. What is that called? Life. But even when life is hard, nothing will separate us. See, the first first question had to do with why. This one has to do with where. Where are you? And sometimes by faith, even when we can't feel God, we have to say, God, I know you're with me. I don't feel like you're with me. It doesn't feel like you're here. Lord, as I'm having to go into the, I feel very lonely. I feel very alone. But you promised you're with me. So, Lord, thank you that you're with me. As I walk through this. Imagine how your church would change if you saw each other through God's eye. Imagine how the world would respond if Christians saw people the way God sees them. I love the verse that Paul says when you're entertaining people. That you could be entertaining angels unaware. Now, here's what I would love. I would love when the angels come and visit our church. If they would give the pastor a report card. Just want you to know. So-and-so was so busy talking to their friend, they didn't even raise their eyes to say good morning. Just want you to know, I sat by myself in church and nobody went out of their way or greeted me. I just wanted you to know there was nobody helping in the children's ministry. And I came with my baby angel to put him in the nursery and there was no one there. Everywhere we go, though, it shouldn't just be church. What happens if that person at the restaurant... Everybody God loves and cares about. So we need to be there for them. Number three, realize that God's power brings assurance. And this is the how. How are we going to do this? How are we going to know that God is in charge? I, is that picture in there? Did Randy get to? Oh, okay. This is Buster Baggins. And you'll notice Buster Baggins standing in a bowl. Now, at our house, we have three, count them, Three food dishes. I know you're not supposed to. If you're a vet, please don't call me later and tell me I'm a dog abuser. I'm a free-range dog expert. Okay? So, Buster, there's three bowls. If one of the three bowls is empty, Buster will stand in the bowl and bark at me. (laughs) If I don't pay attention, Buster will push the bowl into the kitchen. 
Dad, did you not notice that this bowl is empty? And I'm like, you got two other bowls. You're worried about the one bowl. And Buster's like, exactly. And so as a good dog dad, what do I do? You know what I do. Fine. Everybody happy now? Yes, he has me trained. Now, let me tell you about us. God provides for us. We, most of us have not gone clothless. Most of us have not been attacked by a sword. But we say, but God, what about this bowl? This bowl is not the way I want it to. And we focus on the one bowl we don't like when God has given us so much. We focus on the empty bowl, the struggle. Paul goes to Romans 8, 36 to 39. He says, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Time out. What? Well, he's referring back to Psalms 44. And if you read Psalms 44, that whole passage is like, God, where did you go? What are you doing? I'm miserable. What's going on? What's happening? It's one of those Psalms that we've all felt sometimes when we're standing in the bowl going, my bowl is empty. And then Paul says this, no, it's funny. Paul looks back at the Old Testament and he goes, nah, it's not that way anymore. And then he continues in all these things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I don't know how you can be a more than a conqueror. Like you win twice. I don't know. It's like the opposite of being a dolphin fan. Okay. Just, just think about that and do the opposite. That's what being a conqueror is. So, for, sorry, Suzanne, that hurt your feelings there. Okay, sorry. Hey, it's got to be better than University of Miami this year. But anyway, okay. So, and, and UCF last night. Did anybody's team win this year? Okay. More than conquerors through him who loves us. So it's like winning and winning again. It's like beyond winning. And then it says, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels or demons or the present or the future. Listen, Michael J. Fox showed up for this part of the Bible. Doc came and said, we're going back. Nothing. No powers, neither height or depth or anything in creation will be able to separate us. Listen, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How, God, how are you going to do this? And God just says, I'm going to help you overcome. Don't worry, I'll take care of the bowl. You're worried about the bowl. Focus on me. I'll never forget years ago, my mentor. This has been at least 15 years ago now. Dave Daniel was my mentor for years and years. Such a good man. Played tennis. Very active. And he got a disease that's very similar to Lou Gehrig's disease. I don't remember what it's called. It's very rare. But basically, one at a time, it would start to take his facilities away. One day, all of a sudden, he couldn't walk real well. And then one day, he couldn't use his hands real well. And then one day he couldn't move real well, so they had to put him in a nursing home. So I'd go and visit him at the nursing home, and we would talk for hours. I would sit there with him. I would take notes. He's such a wise man. I have a book in my office, if you go, that says Dave Daniel. And I've got stuff just scribbled in there, half of which I'm like, why don't you write Nieder Brookins, right? And I'll never forget, one day I went in, and he could no longer speak. And he just looked at me, and he couldn't tell me what he was thinking. He tried. And I remember praying and going, God, Why? You know, how are you going to use somebody like this? So I'd go back and I would just talk to him. And I remember one day his caretaker came in. I was getting ready to sit him up to feed him something. And he looked at me and said, hey, you know what's really neat? Every time I sit him up, he smiles at me. See, no matter where you're at and what happens, God can use you. If everything is taken away from you, God can use your story. Because his goal is not to make your life pretty and beautiful and you get everything you want and the Smurfs show up and Willy Wonka gives you the golden ticket and, you know, all the things that TV preachers are telling you today. The truth is, when he comes, you become more like Jesus. And you love people like you've never loved them. Not because you're able to, but because his love flows in you. His presence is in you. So you can love a jerk. You can care about somebody who you know is messed up. 
You can get emotionally healthy because you recognize God wants to work things for the good. But I got to look in the mirror and deal with some of my attitude and actions and laziness and, you know, attitude and all the things. If you're in a questioning time, I want you to know God can give you peace and hope and assurance. But in the middle of it, don't go to somebody who just lost somebody and say, God works everything for the good. That's like throwing this in their face. Okay? But know this for you. If you're going through a cornstarch moment, God will use that cornstarch along with his power and his love and his presence to help you to be more than a conqueror. And people will say, what a blessing that person is. I see Jesus when I see them. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step to being able to deal with those sour things, those difficult things, those hard things in life. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. I'll be here. If you're watching online, you can send me a note. If you're, hearing a, you're a Christian, I know you've been focusing on whatever your difficulty is. It's normal. It's okay. But say to God, God, I want to surrender. The Bible says to present your request to him. You know what that means? God, I give you this present. Would you deal with it? Let's go to Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for your power, your strength, your love. Father, I pray that in the moments where things attitudes, actions don't go the way we want them to. Lord, even when we fail and falter, you say when we seek you, when we come back to you, that you can even use those mistakes that we've made for your good. So we surrender all things to you. Lord, I pray if anyone here today or watching online has never surrendered to you, that today would be the day that they recognize that you died for their sins. You rose again. And when they repent, when they turn from their sins, lay their lives at your feet. And follow you that you give them your righteousness. Lord, as Christians, we forget that we're more than conquerors. We feel like failures. We just feel frustrated. Lord, thank you that you've given us success in you. In Jesus' name, amen.